everybody, welcome back to the Home Church Network. Uh, we're glad that you are worshiping with us. And uh, regardless of where you are, if you know where your Bible is, uh, we can be confident that where two or three are gathering in his name, he's uh, here with us. And so we're thankful for the chance to worship the Lord together with you today. Um, open your Bibles to Romans 8, if you haven't already. Today we're returning to our series, The Power to Change, which is our verse-by-verse study through Romans chapter 8. So let's just do a Quick review while you're finding that. The power to change is the power to choose, which without Christ we don't have. We can only ever sin. Even our righteousnesses are sin uh, in God's eyes without Christ. So uh, in Christ we have the power to choose between right and wrong. We have the power. uh, That power to change begins in the mind. That's mentioned five times in three verses. Uh, Right here in Romans 8, that those who... um, Walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. For those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the... It's pretty easy to see what the theme is, right? Where your mind is. It's all about what you think. It's not what you eat. It's what eats away at you. And so uh, all change begins with a change of mind... And the power to change begins in the mind, our thinking. And then uh, we studied over a couple of weeks, the power to change is the Holy Spirit. Fourteen times in 16 verses, the Spirit, the Spirit, by the Spirit, according to the Spirit, this new life within us called the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God lives in us. As many as are uh, led by the Spirit, these are the children of God. And so He lives within us. We talked all about five indications of life in the Spirit and how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The power to change is the Holy Spirit. And uh, such a clear theme in the text. Then, uh, according to the Holy Spirit, uh, He is inspired to turn the subject to um, the sufferings of this present life. And uh, so it's really, really interesting. Let me just read Uh, the scripture today. We're down to verse 26. We'll take three verses today, God willing. Uh, Verse 26, Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit, there it is again, twice in the same verse, Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Leading to the greatest verse in the Bible for Christians, Romans 8, 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to Uh, to his purpose. Now, if you have been a Christian or been around Christians, you've heard this verse quoted or candidly misquoted uh, probably a lot of times. The title of this message is How to Put Your Hope in God. The psalmist said, put your hope in God. But of course, how do we do that? Now, the answer is coming your way uh, today. But before we can even get to that, Uh, What does hope have to do with change? The idea that God wants to transform His children into the likeness of Christ. Well, what's the opposite of hope? The opposite of hope is despair. Now, that's a dark word. Despair is not, why is this happening? Or, how long is this going to be happening? Despair is not, uh, why is this happening to me? Uh, Despair is, who cares what's happening? Despair is, life is over. I'm over. Nothing matters anymore. Kathy and I had... I lunch this week with a lady that uh, we've known for many years who lives out of state now, and it's been our privilege to minister to her. And she said, basically, when I get my estate in order, my life is over. And boy, did we tell her straight, nothing is over. Nothing is over. In fact, that brings to mind a, a uh, particular uh, movie clip that I'm very fond of. Watch this. It's over, Jenny. It's over. Nothing is over. Nothing. You just don't turn it off. It wasn't my war. You asked me, I didn't ask. Get it? Nothing is over. And you have to be the one to stand up and say, nothing is over. But when despair takes over, I mean, when hope is gone, when you stop putting your hope in God, which I hope to teach you how to do today, when you allow despair to begin to wash over you like a flood, I mean, change is dead in the water. Um, I'm not trying to change. I'm not working toward change. I'm 
you know, blankety blank out of here. This is over. And uh, I'm going to teach you the powerful message of these three verses, but I really honestly, this is such a tender, tender passage, and it's at a place where people really live in such sensitive matters that I wish that this didn't have to be a sermon. I wish this could just be a maybe a personal conversation with me and you over a cup of coffee because I understand, my wife and I both understand what it is to feel despair. Of course, like most of us, I've had plenty of discouragement pastoring a church, planting churches around the world, preaching all over the place for so many years. Lots of disappointment, but not realizing that I had never actually despaired, not before 2019, not certainly about my own life. I mean, I've despaired for others, but never for myself. I knew discouragement, you know, plenty of dark days, even some days that I might have called hopeless, but despair is when you don't care anymore what happens. Every day is about can't get out of bed, don't care if the sun comes up, don't have any hope of any kind. And that's why that condition, if you understand it, if you've experienced it, that's why we have Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and all three of these verses in the middle of a passage on the power to change you. Like, what's this doing here? Here's why it's here. This is here because the biggest obstacle to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in you is you. Can I say that again? That the biggest obstacle to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in you is you, and that's my testimony too. The biggest obstacle, let me say it that way, the biggest obstacle to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in me is me, and the biggest obstacle to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in you is, say it, is you. And when you look at life, um, how you got here and what's ahead, if you feel no hope, if you only feel despair, if your hope is dead in the water, note this, the Holy Spirit empowers us but he does not overpower us. And because the Holy Spirit is aware of the reality that despair is the thing that would keep us from changing, he stops, or call it continues, in this perfect thing called the Word of God in Romans chapter 8 on the power to change, and he directs himself particularly to the person who's despairing, knowing that they are not part of God's purposes for change in this world. You just kind of, I'm just not up for it anymore. You see, the Holy Spirit is the wind in your sails, so to speak. The Holy Spirit is the, to say it another way, is the gas in your tank for transformation. Or to say it another way, the Holy Spirit is the fire in the furnace that is the series, Romans 8, the power to change. And the Holy Spirit is the fire in that furnace fueling. But look, if you fold up your sail and you're like, I'm out. This is over. If you park your car, it doesn't matter how much gas is in it. If you stop putting logs on the fire and the fire goes out, the furnace stops. Do you get it? Change is dead in the water. This Romans 8, 18 through 28 is powerfully and perfectly situated to catch us at the moment of, you can talk how to change all you want to, I don't want it anymore. All right? Now, you, <laughs> I didn't even mean to get that fired up because I know how sensitive these things are. You may be saying, hold on, James, before you get into all this change stuff, I got to tell you, I've been through a ton and I'm really not up for a lecture about God's sovereignty or a scolding about my faith. Boy, do I understand that. It's, believe me, I know from experience when you're in that place or near that place where hope is gone, you know, candidly, Christians it can be kind of insensitive. Like, they use God's sovereignty, which is what Romans 8, 28 is all about, the idea that God is in control. They use that like a big stick. And, you know, that's why... Um, I started the Home Church Network because I had never experienced in my life what it was like to not be able to go to church because it would take me five days to get over the things that people said to me when I went there. When you're standing over milk that's been spilt and plans that have gone south that the loss is so significant you can't even pray. 
You can't pray because you can't imagine a way that it could ever make sense or even get better. You can't envision a future to ask God to bring about and to be in that spot and have somebody show up and start spilling truisms with their big, heavy, sappy hand all over your shoulder like so many plaques at a craft fair or t-shirts at a souvenir shop. It's just like, seriously, this is what you have for me? You know, <laughs> I hope you haven't experienced this or more so. I hope you don't do this. I know I am certainly at a place where I'm never going to ever do this to anyone again. God forgive me if and when I have. You know, the person who shows up in the middle of your despair and is like, hey, brother, God is sovereign, you know. you got to just let go and let God. you got to come to the end of yourself. You know, God's wisdom starts where your wisdom ends. Blah, 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 blah. Christian stuff. Christian stuff. Put it on a tea towel, man. When you're in despair, these are the kind of sentences that feel like getting flogged. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's not awesome. And um, if you're at despair, you don't need someone to show up with a decoupage to nail to your wall or a bumper sticker for your car. And because I understand that pain, before I walk you through the verses that I believe God's Holy Spirit has provided for us, let me just start with giving an overview of this matter of God's sovereignty. By the way, a word that's not even used in the Bible. But here's, here's a bit of an overview of God's sovereignty. The idea that God is sovereign, certainly the Scripture teaches it, though it doesn't say it, but the idea that God is sovereign, a supreme in power and authority, um, um, that He is independent and unlimited by any other, uh, that he is chief or the highest supreme, that he is the rightful ruler. When we speak of the sovereignty of God, we mean his right and his ability to rule the universe. Just think about those two things. His right to rule the universe and his ability to rule the universe. That is the totality of what we mean when we say that God is sovereign. His complete control of all that it is and so it should be. Now, the reason why sovereignty is so significant and why theologians so often are arguing about it and debating about it is because it really is a central feature. If you think of, of a hub on a wheel and all of the spokes being the beauty and the totality of who God is, at the center of it all is his sovereignty. Let me um, show you or explain to you why that is. Every major attribute of God, like... <laughs> the two big categories are communicable and incommunicable. If you want to go back to seminary for a few days, God's communicable attributes, well, we should start higher. God's incommunicable attributes are the things that will never be true of us and are not commanded of us. God is omniscient. He knows everything. We're, we don't, nor ever will. Not in this life. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful, and nothing limits him or his purposes in any way. Those are his incommunicable attributes, and there are others. His transcendence, which means that God is completely and totally other, entirely unlike us, which is capsulized in the word holy, um, but that's not incommunicable, shockingly. God's holiness is not incommunicable. Um, his in, in, immutability, the fact that he does not change. God cannot change. He does not change. Are you like that? This is a series on how to change and how desperately we need to change. God's not changing. He doesn't need to. Where would you change from total infinite perfection? Do you see? These are God's incommunicable attributes. But then he has communicable attributes, the ones he wants us to possess in increasing measure. Um, that God is love and God is merciful and God is patient. These are the things that he wants for us because in those perfections, we find our greatest happiness. Now, you say, well, James, how is all of that contingent upon the sovereignty of God? Well, here it is. If God were not all-powerful, how could he be sovereign? Total ru rulership requires total power. If God were not all present, how could he be sovereign? How could he rule over his universe with total control if he didn't have access 
to every single corner of all that he has spoken into existence. If God was not transcendent beyond what we know or experience, we could conceivably be on a pathway to be God ourselves like the Mormons teach, but you'll never be God. That's awful false teaching. Um, if God was not immutable, how could he be sovereign? He might change. Today he can get it done. Tomorrow he can't. He used to be able to do it. If God were not all-knowing, he could not be sovereign. If he doesn't know all, how can he possibly control it all? Things he doesn't know out of his gaze, out of his control. Do you see? And so this matter of sovereignty is the center of who God is, and it is the truth that is underpinning Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Uh, my uh, a favorite uh, preacher from history, as many know, is um, A.W. Tozer, who interestingly found himself... Uh, more than 30 years at a church here in Chicago, and then suddenly not in his church uh, right about the time he got into his early 60s. And Tozer said it this way, God is said to be absolutely sovereign because no one and no thing can hinder him or compel him or stop him. He is able to do as he pleases, always, everywhere, forever. To be thus sovereign means also that he must possess universal authority, that he has unlimited power, we know from the scriptures, and may deduce from certain others of his attributes. But what about his, this authority? Even to discuss the sovereignty of Almighty God seems a bit meaningless, and to question it would be absurd. Can we imagine the Lord God of hosts having to request permission of anyone or to apply for anything to a higher body? To whom would God go for permission? Who is higher than the highest? Who is mightier than the Almighty? Whose position antedates that of the eternal? At whose throne would God kneel? Where is the greater one to whom he must appeal? Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And I elevate God in your understanding because what I'm about to teach you about him will require. It was Tozer also who said that the most important thing about you is what you think about God. And... To really understand Romans 8, 28, you need to have a great and biblical view of the Lord God Almighty. Now, in this matter of God's sovereignty, there have been two theological extremes through the ages. Um, Arminianism, which places an overemphasis on the will of man and the freedom of man. Jesus did teach whosoever will may come, and there is human volition. But Arminians uh, teach that you can lose your salvation, that you can't know for sure if you're saved, and that's a doctrinal error that actually is on the rise. Calvinism's kind of had its way for the last 25 years or so. I would say Calvinism is significantly in decline in these days because inevitably, as these cycles go through history, uh, people come to see the limits of, say, limited atonement, which is not what the Bible teaches, and... That would be one of the things in Calvinism that is an overemphasis. The Arminians are trying to hold out the responsibility of man, and they put a heavy emphasis on personal holiness. The Calvinists are trying to hold out the sovereignty of God, and so they want God to be so sovereign that they start adding things to the Scriptures that are not uh, really there. Where we want to be is just in the center of it all, that God is in fact sovereign, but not in a way that eclipses your responsibility and the fact that he will hold you responsible for the choices that you make. So, having said all of that, uh, let me say this, rightly understood, the sovereignty of God is not a club to beat the discouraged. You know, God's sovereign, brother. Yeah, I know, I know, but this sucks right now. Rightly understood, the sovereignty of God is not a club to beat the discouraged, but a crown of confidence for those who struggle to reconcile God's promised goodness and their circumstances. Fact. Hear this. For the average person who hears Romans chapter 8, verse 28, they think to themselves this. Well, if God is working all things together for my good, why doesn't this feel more good? Why doesn't this look more good? And that's what I'm going to get into in just a moment. Um, but just start here. The word sovereign is an incredible word, okay? It's an awesome word, but 
uh, <laughs> as I've kid uh, through the years, another important word uh, for, to understand this passage is the word but, and uh, not to be confused with the word but. In fact, I've been promising for a long time that I'm going to preach a series on great buts in the Bible. I've been promising it for so long that people actually began writing to me and asking for me, when are you going to do the series on the great buts in the Bible? Ah, uh, soon. The answer is soon. But the fact is, the word but is a very, very powerful word in the English language. And uh, it's a very powerful word in the Bible. It's a strong conjunctive, a sudden contrast. I would call it uh, an enlightening addition without the conclusion cannot be properly formed. Okay? So uh, let me just tell you that I'm going to talk to you now about hope, the final part of this passage on hope. Uh, just stop for a second because I know this is compl complicated and I want you to really get it. The series is the power to change. We've got a lot of input on you can choose and the power comes from the Spirit and you have to get your perspective back or you're going to lose your hope. And then now in his final plea about hope, because if you lose hope, you're not going to be interested in changing. In the final portion of this, he's going to make the greatest promise about God to help every single person whose circumstances make them to want to give up on God's agenda for their life. He's going to make this incredible, incredible promise. And I want to give it to you in the context of hope because um, I understand that hope, um, when you lose hope, we've said uh, you lose everything. And hoping is not supposed to be a hurtful thing. Some of you say, James, don't you understand it hurts to hope? Yeah, I understand that it hurts to hope. That's why I'm trying to adopt uh, a tone here that will help you hear something that is entirely, irreversibly, and infinitely true. But it's just not easy to hear it, that God is working all things together for my good. It's easier to believe the universe is out of control. It's easier to lose faith. It's easier to give up on my faith than it is to believe that God is truly working all things together for my good. So let me give you three points. I'm going to frame them all the same way with a big but in the middle. Yes, it hurts to hope, but it hurts to keep hoping that your son will come home. It hurts to keep hoping that the test results will change. We were with someone else this week who's staring down a short hallway of, you know, the chemo and radiation needs to work soon. Or it's, it's, uh, it's not coming back. I really get it. It hurts to keep hoping. It's easier to give up. But here's the first of three things from verse 26. The Holy Spirit prays for you personally. I mean, someone pulled the fire alarm. What? What? Yes. You. How many people in the world? Six billion. How taxed is the Holy Spirit? Not at all. And he prays personally for you. How can he be praying for all of us at once? He can. How can God be hearing God the Father hearing all this all at once? He can. Let me show it to you in the text. Stop with your questions. My gosh, you get so wound up about your questions. Just let the text speak. Or was that me? Okay, come on. Romans 8, 26. Likewise... The Spirit helps us, that likewise is like similarly or in the same way. In the same way what? Oh, here it is. In the same way as creation is groaning, verse 22, we know the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth. In the same way that um, we as believers are groaning, notice, and not the creation only, verse 23, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly. So creation is groaning. We as believers are groaning. Why? Because the world's broken, because it doesn't work right. Ah! Ah! Groaning or travailing, you might say. Actually, the uh, Greek sounds more like Italian. Uh, the word is stenazzo. Stenazzo. We're groaning. Stenazzo. It's like you could say that as your groaning words. Denazo! Why is it like this? It's not working. And then we get the Holy Spirit illustration. It's like, it's like childbirth. The whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Right? Not just the mother, 
Everybody gets the pain of the mother. But the text, uh, the word stenazo actually means groaning together. So not just that the mother is having pain, but how about, how about the mother's mother? What's the mother? I've been right by the mother's mother in a lot of births lately. And, and, uh, or the mother-in-law, the mother's like, oh God, please let her be okay. And she's stenazo, she's groaning. And then what the mother-in-law, let it be a healthy boy. And we know of all the terrible things that families go through and stenazo. And, and then the father is, is groaning too in the pains of child's birth. What, what, what's best for my wife? What's best for our life? And everything's on the line and we're in the delivery room finally. And he's certainly groaning, right? And then the father's father this is happening too soon and who's going to take care of all this and and everyone's feeling the pain of life stenazo stenazo everyone groaning together in the pain of the fact that this life is broken this life is just broken so the pain of childbirth is one of the illustrations the biblical illustration of stenazo the the, the pain of labor that leads to the beautiful result of the child being born. But let's take uh, Godet, the great uh, Bible commentator, uh, uses the illustration of a, a bride at her wedding. And he says, nature with its melancholy charm resembles a bride who at the very moment she was fully attired for marriage saw the bridegroom die. She still stands with her fresh crown and in her bridal dress, but her eyes are full of tears. And as painful as that illustration is, that is what this text is saying. That the reward, that the joy, that the unchanging fulfillment of all that God has promised is yet future for every Christian. No matter how good your day is going, no matter how great your week has been, no matter whether you've lost a child or lost a marriage or lost a business or whatever your profound loss is that pushes you to the brink of despair, God's provision for that is the assurance of someday not the solution of now. And so much preaching is so faulty because it tries to give you the false expectation that somehow God's going to make it all perfect today. And that is not, not... You can hear me getting wound up about the pain that is caused by bad teaching. And I am bothered about it. I feel it's so much better and so right to actually give to you what the Bible promises to you. The astounding reality is that the Holy Spirit is groaning too. All of that was to say you're not the only one who's groaning, and this is what blows my mind. It's not just that creation is groaning. It's not just that I'm groaning. It's that the Holy Spirit is stenazo to the Father for us that this is not getting solved, this is not going away. And notice when it's happening. Notice in the text, Likewise, the Spirit helps our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And, and uh, now, if you weren't understanding the Scripture right, you might be kind of like, what do I need to pray for? I don't need to pray no more. Stenazzo. The Holy Spirit's going to pray for me. Why would I pray a lousy prayer if the Holy Spirit can pray a prayer for me? But that's not what it's saying. It's not saying that we stop praying. It's saying in our weakness, there I am praying, but I don't know what to pray. We do not know what to pray for. The reason I'm not praying is because I don't know what to pray. And this is so messed up, I can't even think of a solution See, and the text calls it my weakness in my humanity. I can't even think of how this could get better. I can't even think of how this could turn around. I can't even imagine a solution that could happen. I've never heard of anything happening like what would need to happen here. And so when I don't know what to pray or how to pray, isn't it great to know that we don't have to think up our own answers to prayer? Heaven has no suggestion boxes, y'all. Okay, God's not up in heaven. Hey, what are we going to do here? Somebody check the suggestion box. See if we got anything good from planet Earth. No, no, we do not. And then I want to say this to you, too, because, you know, can candidly, I don't know why I'm uh, thinking these days so often about bad preaching that I've heard, but I want to be faithful to the Lord and I want to be faithful to you. And do you see the phrase in the text? We likewise um, 
The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for. Do you see that? As we ought. Bad, bad Christian. If you weren't so sinful, you'd know what to pray for. That's not what it's saying. You ought to know what to pray. No, it's not what it's saying. Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And God's not like, fine, fine, the Spirit will pray. You should know what to pray, but you don't know what to pray like you ought to, so we'll pray for you. Fine, we'll take that on too, like we're not already running the universe. That's not it at all. So it's not ought to as in if you were stronger, you'd do better. And it's not ought to as in if you were smarter or more attentive, you'd know what to pray, but you're just, you're just not paying it. No, no. Everyone say no, 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 nope, 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 nope. That's not what it's saying. In the context, the ought is the stenazo. It's the groaning. The, 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 the creation is groaning, and I'm groaning because I, I just, this is so broken. This is not the way it's supposed to be. This is not working out very awesome. And I don't even know what to pray. And right there in my weakness, not in my sinfulness, right there in my brokenness. Like, I don't even want to pray because I just sit there on my knees and I don't even know what to say. I don't have anything to ask. Stop imagining God as your parents or some other fear-based imagining, okay? Let God be the God of the Bible to you. Let God be uh, the eternally loving and grace-filled, always for you, sovereign God that he reveals himself to be in Scripture. Let God be that for you. Can, can, I, can I give you an illustration? This is a, you know I'm coming back to Romans 8, but this is like a favorite, favorite passage for me. It's the passage that vertical church is based upon. And let me give you the, it's Exodus 34, but to give you the context, do you remember this? So Moses goes up into um, the mountain um, to get the Ten Commandments from God. You with me on this? Do you know what's happening? Okay, so Moses goes up into the mountain to get the Ten Commandments from God, and he um, is taking a long time. I don't know why, it's taking a long time. So much so that when Moses came down from the presence of the Lord, his face was shining. But what did he find the people doing? They were having an orgy, a debauchery festival. Uh, it was filthy, it was awful. They made a golden calf because Moses had come back. We won't worship God anymore. Let's worship this calf. Everybody bring your earrings. That's what they did. It's in the text. And Moses was so upset about it that he lost his temper. Terrible man. And he loved the people so much and he loved the Lord so much and he just couldn't accept their struggle. And he threw down the tablets that God had written on with his own finger, the Bible says, and he broke them. Moses wasn't the only one who was distraught. God was distraught. So much so that God said to Moses, I'm not even taking these people up to the promised land. I'm going to kill them all. And we're going to start over with you. You're the new Adam. You're the new Noah. We're going to do this a third time. We'll get it right. And Moses loved the people so much, in spite of his anger toward them for their rebellion, righteous anger, I might add, that he pleads with God, don't do this. Don't do this. How can we go up without you? How could we go without you? Go without you. Like, breathe without oxygen? Tan without sun, sleep without dark. You're, you're it. You are God. How can we go without you? He had been, of course, the uh, cloud of uh, the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. He had been the manna from heaven. He was everything to them. How can we go without you? It's, just, it's, it's not conceivable. And Moses pleaded and pleaded and pleaded until God relented for the people's rebellion. Now, this is the awesome part. He, he says in Exodus 34, I guess I'm just kind of telling you from memory, like I said, a favorite passage. He's, God says, okay, I will go up with you. And Moses is like, well, it's, it's important that you do because if you don't, and he's like, he didn't even hear him. He was so spun up about it. And then the Lord just stops him and says, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, this is so awesome. He said, what would you say if God said, what, what do you want me to do for you? Moses said, show me your glory. he just come off the mountain with an experience like what heaven would be like for eternity. And he was all cut up in the people and their sin and the golden calf. And, and how are we going to get to the promised land? But God said, what do you want me to do for you? And Moses was like, just show me again. Just show me again how awesome you are and I don't need anything else. So God puts him in a little rock and he passes by and he reveals himself to him. And all of that gets us to Exodus 34. 
How will God, the God of fire, the God of Ten Commandments, the God of, well, let's start over. How will he reveal himself to the children of Israel? This is what blows my mind. Here's the revelation of God in that moment. Revelation 34, 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. This is how God chose to reveal himself. So if you're reading through the passage, you're like, you don't know how to pray for us, you ought to, because, and you have all these things in your head like, yeah, it's my fault again. I don't know how to do anything right. You, that's not how God reveals himself, not even when we're falling, not even when we're failing. He reveals himself as a God of infinite love and justice for you even when you don't feel it, even when you can't see it. You didn't earn it. You can't maintain it. It is entirely of God and entirely not of us. Even the faith to believe, the Bible says, is a gift from God. So you can take that off your to-do list, okay? So what would be the question that you would ask upon discovering that the Holy Spirit here in Romans 8 the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ was praying for you. What question would you ask? Someone said, hey, did you know, do you understand the Holy Spirit's praying for you? <laughs> I think the question that I would ask right away is, what's he saying? Can I hear, you got a recording of that? Man, I'd love to listen in on that prayer, but that would lift my spirits. Actually, the text says that um, no one's ever heard this. The Spirit prays for us as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. It actually means literally cannot be uttered. It has never, is not uttered. It's not, it's not that you can't hear it. It's not that you can't understand it. It's that it's not spoken. It's not audible. Remember, God is one. And this is the Trinity conversing amongst itself. So the words are unrecognizable. This is communication within the triune God, unheard and unhearable as your own thoughts. It's just awesome. Mystery. Everyone say mystery. God and three persons conversing with himself. Now, the great uh, missionary Robert Murray McShane from a long time ago said this. He said, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room. I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Hebrews chapter 7 says that Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. And I can tell you, based on God's word, loved one, he is praying for you right now. Whatever you don't know what to pray about, whatever you don't know what to ask for, I mean, what an awesome, awesome truth. Do you get it? This is a bit of a sales pitch, <laughs> biblically speaking, for hope. And I'm suggesting to you, yes, it hurts to hope. I get it, it hurts to hope. It's easier to give up, it's easier to lay down. I really get it, it's hard to live in hope. But the Holy Spirit is praying for you. Change is derailed when hope is lost. And change can begin again when faith ignites hope and we can begin to believe what's coming in Romans chapter eight. Now, the best word in the verse, I'm still on verse 26. Sorry, it's too awesome to hurry. I'm tired of hurrying. I don't need to hurry no more. Romans 8, 26, here it is. Likewise, the Spirit, there's the best word, helps. Helps us in our weakness. Well, what's he actually doing with these prayers, these prayings for us? He's helping you. He's helping you. And um, you, got any more on, you got any more on the word help? Actually, I do. The best way to understand a verse in the Bible is to look how it's used in the Bible. And interestingly, this verse here translated helps. Do you see it there in your text? That verse, translated help, is only used one other place in the New Testament. Do you know where? Do you know where? Do you know where? Here's where. Remember, in Luke chapter 10, you might not remember where, but I think some of you would know the story. Uh, Jesus was uh, crashing at uh, Mary and Martha's house, and Martha was like, let's make a big meal for him. Let's really, you know, put it on for him. And so she's getting this big meal together. What's Mary doing? Do you know? And Mary's like sitting at his feet, which seems awesome. I think I'm going to probably make that play. 
but Martha is a little sideways about it. In fact, so that I don't misquote our sister that we'll spend eternity with, won't it be cool to meet her? Luke chapter 10 says, but Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? I'm trying to begin too many paragraphs that way, if you can help it, because that always gets just slaughtered. Remember when the disciples said, hey, we're dying in this storm. Don't you care? And he just like, peace, be still. And they're like, never mind. Right? So very responsive to the feeling that his children would think, just as you would be to your children, to the accusation that you don't care. Let me go to work on that one right now. I do care. And even if it seems like I don't care, it's the seeming that's the problem. It's not the reality. And so she rolls this out. You know, she's kind of tired, you know, getting the roast out of the oven or whatever. And Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve here all alone? I'm doing all the work. She's doing all the worship. And without even getting into what Jesus says about that, the point is this. Tell her then to help me. That's the word. That's the word. Back to Romans 8, 26. That's the word right there. And it actually um, has the idea of uh, joining together or... or um, or working together, or it's a present indicative. It, it indicates continuous action that the Holy Spirit is actually taking a share. He's helping us. He's taking a share in the work. So I have a task to do. Look here. I have this task to do. And it is re going to require of me more time than I have, more strength than I have, more wisdom than I have. And I am completely overwhelmed with what's ahead of me. And the Holy Spirit is taking a share of the task. That's why he's praying for you. He's taking a portion, what, what, what Martha perceived that Mary would not do, the Holy Spirit is doing for you. The Holy Spirit is actively and continually praying for me, for you, to be strong in the Lord, to put on the whole armor of God, to fight the good fight, to stand and having done all to stand, to put everything in perspective out of the temporary and into the eternal. Birth pains promise something very good soon. And when I'm having trouble believing it, and I'm having trouble seeing it, and I'm having trouble waiting for it, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is, wait, is praying. The third, scratch that. The third person of the Trinity is praying for me. Yeah, it hurts to hope, but the Father knows, this is the second thing, the Father knows you perfectly. Check this, verse 27. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints. This is so awesome, I just almost fell off my bike when I read this, Okay. And he who searches the hearts. Who, who is it that actually searches our hearts? Do you know who that is? He who searches the hearts. Uh, here it is. Just jot down these references. Proverbs 15, 11 um, says, Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. That's the grave, basically. The entirety of life. How much more the hearts of the children of men. God sees our hearts. He sees everything. Notice also he tests our hearts. Proverbs 17, 3 says, The crucible is for silver and the furnace for gold, and the Lord tests the hearts. God sees your heart. God is testing your heart. And then get this. God is bringing justice where needed. Jeremiah eleven twenty, 20. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the hearts and the minds, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. What are the things that you need God so desperately to do that are so wrong and leave and are left unresolved? God's on it. God's on it. Jeremiah 17, 10 says that God brings reward where it's deserved. Eleven twenty, he brings vengeance where it's needed. And he brings 17, 10, Jeremiah, he brings reward where it's deserved. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So, yes, it hurts to hope, but God, look at the text, Romans 8, 27. He who searches the hearts, who is that? God the Father. We just looked at four verses that say that. 
He who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Of course, it's one person, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Of course, he knows his own mind. But wait, this is more than that. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints. The reason why he knows the, the mind of the Spirit is because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, more than his omniscience would give, more than his omnipresence would observe, somehow a deeper knowledge is gleaned by the Father because, see it in the text, the Spirit himself intercedes. So, from the groanings of of creation, from the groanings, the stenazo of God's children, from the groanings of the Spirit when we can't even continue in prayer, the Father gleans the deepest understanding of what you are thinking. Is it possible that the third person of the Trinity living within us has a deeper understanding of us than even God the Father has? Something is happening that is being communicated to the Father through those groanings more even than we could know or understand. Too deep for words, the scripture says. The Spirit himself intercedes. Wow. And notice according to the will of God, meaning that the Spirit knows so perfectly and personally in oneness with the will of the Father that the prayers are always on point. Hands up if you've ever prayed a dumb prayer that in the end turned about, man, I wish I had been asking for that, right? So I prayed a dumb prayer, but now... I know that the Spirit is in there. Not that, that, not that, that, not that, that. Keeping my prayers on point in my weakness when I can't stop groaning, He is groaning with me. Leading to Romans 8, 28 and the conclusion of this message. Like, you know where you're going to get through Romans 8, 28? I just said I'd start it. I didn't say I'd finish it. We'll pick it right up there next time. Calm down. Ready? Love you. Romans 8, 28. So in 26, yes, it hurts, but the Spirit is praying for us. In Romans 8, 27, yes, it hurts, but the Father knows you perfectly because of the Spirit's groanings and prayers when you're too weak. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, yes, it hurts to hope, but God is working for my good powerfully. Notice in the text, and we know, never preached a whole sermon around this, that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Well, first of all, we know. Isn't it awesome to know things? You know when you know that you know that you know, and it doesn't matter what anyone said, you're like, nah, they're going to see soon, they're wrong, I'm right. Not like, not stubborn, not like opinionated, not like, oh, I know who's going to win the election. Not that. Not that overbearing, overconfident, unrelated facts. I'm talking about something that you know. You know that you know that you know. It's so great to know something. And here he says, and we know this, the joy of being certain and absolutely sure about this, that all things work together for good. Now, the word God is not in the text. If you, sorry to say, if you uh, bought into a translation that says that God is working all things together for the good of those, that's not what it says. And God comes into it to those who love God. But actually, um, it was a uh, early church father that was bothered by the absence of God. He thought it was too materialistic. And he thought that it said that, you know, um, Maybe that things, inanimate objects, personification of objects, that somehow the objects have a power, a materialism that isn't biblical. Maybe almost a fatalism. And maybe they thought that it was kind of what became evolutionary thinking, that things are themselves are working in the trees and the planet, the broken stuff. That's not what it's teaching at all. It's just simply saying that God is unseen in this. God is unseen in this that from the perspective of how we see it, my gosh, as time has unfolded, it has become increasingly apparent that God has been working all things, my good choices, shocker, my bad choices, the things I should have done sooner and the things I wish I could go back and redo, the things that other people have done to me or with me or 
against me or what I have, what I don't have, all things. Take a minute and put into the box everything that comes under the category of all things. I'm like, that would take me forever. Yes, it would. All things means, say it, all things. That all things are working together for the good of those who love God. It's a remarkable statement. Make a note of this. God does not have to write every page to control how the story ends. He just doesn't have to. Fact is, we don't know everything. And um, God is certainly involved in the details, but doesn't need to control every detail. Ephesians 1 says that he determines all things according to the counsel of his will, but does that mean he's actually choosing when I get out of bed and choosing when I brush my teeth? Is he controlling whether my hair grows back or doesn't? That's not your business. I mean, what level of detail does God have to control to be, I, I think, not as detailed as some theologians say? I think like the chef stirs a pot, like the chess master controls the board, I think that it doesn't matter that much the choices that we make. God is causing all things to work together for the good who, of those who love him. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever flown a kite? There's been some real windy days here recently. Have you ever flown a kite? So who actually is flying the kite? Is the little boy flying the kite? Is the wind flying the kite? Is the God of the wind flying the kite? Who's flying the kite? The point is, is regardless of the wind or the child, God is making your, sure that your kite, remove kite, insert life. God is making sure that your life flies and lands at a good destination. And notice again, we know this. Over time, we should be learning increasingly that what seemed dark, what seemed lost, what seemed no return, now it's over for sure. What did Job say? Job 23.10, He knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. Okay? Notice the passage does not say, I feel the way that I take, and I feel like I'll come forth as gold. He didn't say, I see the way that I take, and I see that I'll come forth as gold. He knows, same as we know here. Make a note of this. Knowing is better than seeing. The appearance can always change. Knowing is better than feeling, because feelings, they, we all know, they come and go. When we know God is working for our good, we need not fear the final outcome of anything. Knowing it won't be final until it's good. Nothing is over. If it's not good, it's not final. If it's not awesome yet, it's not done. All right, now Proverbs 13, 12 says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I gotta say, my heart's been pretty sick. I have had more heart sickness these last couple of years than in all of our life previously combined. And maybe you understand that too personally yourself, or maybe you yet will understand that. But let me just say that hope in God is never deferred because it's never final until it's all good. And people say, it's all good, but they don't mean it's all good. They mean, stop bugging me about it. But we're not wasting our time to hope in God because it's never final until it's good. Now, we can go through the rest of Romans 8, 28 next time, but just bow with me in a word of prayer. And let me just talk to you personally. And by closing your eyes, if you're not alone, it's going to make our conversation that much more personal. Would you do that for me? And I know that I won't see whether you do it or not. When I used to preach in a large room, I would look at people and then they would close their eyes. But could you just imagine for a moment that I'm looking at you right now? I know what I'm doing when I ask you to close your eyes. You're now you're looking inside. And this just became a lot more personal. Let me say that God wants you to be actively engaged in his transforming purposes for your life. God wants that for you. 
And if you've become discouraged and turned away from that agenda, let me encourage you to lean in afresh to confessing and forsaking sin, to keeping your heart free of bitterness by active engagement in grace and forgiveness, turning over to God where the kite flies and where the kite lands, and just knowing that he's going to get it there in a good way at an awesome time. And if you've stopped hoping, that's because you're low on faith. And if you're low on faith, you're not changing. So if we're going to get the power to change, we have to address this matter of hope being lost. Next time we're going to come back to this glorious verse. There's no way I could plumb its depths maybe in a year, let alone in a couple of weeks. So we'll pick up right here where we're leaving off. But for now, let me just encourage you to lay down. Father, I pray in this moment for my brother, for my sister, for this home church gathering, for someone who has found their way here and knows nothing about us but is here by your appointment. O oh, sovereign God, I pray in this moment that we would allow your spirit to kindle afresh within us a desire for your deepest work of transformation in us. Forgive us for putting it on hold. Forgive us for letting circumstances let our hearts grow weary in doing good. And let us long afresh, I pray, let us long afresh for the deep things of God and the sense of your presence above all else and the observation of you working and moving in our lives as you once did. It was so beautiful and so glorious and we don't doubt for a moment that you want that again. Forgive us for allowing circumstances to derail us and let us begin afresh, not because we love what's been happening, not because we agree with it, not because we... Um, accept some platitude about it. But our eyes are upon you. And we turn to you afresh and we ask you to make beauty from ashes. We ask you to take control afresh and to allow our hearts to hope afresh. Not in what we can say or do or even how we would pray. But we ask you to make hope fresh within our hearts and invigorate our desire to experience your fullest transforming work within us by your Spirit, for your glory. And as I close, if you agree with this prayer that I'm praying in Jesus' name, just lift up your voice right where you are and say amen. Say it louder, amen. Amen. Amen.